Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about building actual open source software that's highly successful, used by millions of people over decades. Uh, I've been working full time on open source for 20 years almost now. So I'm here to tell you that it's possible to have a career in open source, just open source, not getting a job, working for yourself, writing code. If, if that kind of thing appeals to you, I'm here to tell you that it's possible. Um, it's not easy, but it can be done. Um, so a lot of you are students in this audience, so I'm going to start by saying that my open source journey also started when I was a student uh, many, many years ago. And uh, it led to a, a full career in open source. Um, so I'll just talk for a little while, and then I'm going to throw, the, throw, throw this open for questions. I, I find uh, interactive discussion much more engaging than just droning on myself. Um, so uh, my open source journey started, funnily enough, uh, making a little desktop widget. Way back then, I used to use the KDE desktop environment, and it had a system. So yeah, so I was uh, I, had, I made a little desktop widget for a system called uh, Super Caramba and KDE, and uh, this allowed you to sort of make widgets using Python. And I was like, Python is an easy language; I can learn it. So I learned it, and uh, I made the widget, and I uploaded it on various websites. Uh, it was to show an amount of unread email in different folders. I'm pretty sure no one other than me ever used it. But the uh, good part was that it introduced me to open source contributions. It was my first open source project, and I learned Python out of it. And it gave me the confidence to do bigger things uh, later on. So let me talk about uh, my most successful open source project, uh, which is Calibre, which is a program for managing ebooks. It allows you to manage your ebook collection, read them, convert them to different formats, send them to devices. I'm sure quite a few of you use Calibre or have heard of it. Um, it, it has about 3 million users all, all, all over the globe now, and uh, it's my primary source of income. It's uh, what I spend most of my day working on. Um, but it all started uh, when I was a, a grad student at Caltech. Uh, you know, grad students are famous for having a lot of spare time. So uh, uh, I was working on my, on my thesis uh, ostensibly, but uh, I actually started Calibre then. So the story was that uh, I was then, and still am now, an avid reader. I read maybe one or two books a week. And uh, back then, as a student, I didn't have a lot of money, so I couldn't buy books. And there weren't really good libraries that had the kind of books I was interested in. So I used to go online to various websites, download books, convert, get the text out of them, and read that text on my computer. And I also had a little handheld device. It was a GPS device, funnily enough, but it had the ability to read text files. So of course, this wasn't an optimal experience, to say the least. Um, and in 2006, Sony, the electronics company, uh, introduced the first e-ink-based e-book reader, which was the PRS500. Um, and almost the day it was announced, I went out and got myself one rather impulsively. Uh, remember the part about poor student. So when I got it, when I when I got home, I was kind of horrified to learn that it was. I, I tried to use it, and I hor was horrified to learn that it was kind of. It, 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 you had to use it by connecting it to a computer with a USB cable. And it spoke a proprietary USB protocol, and there was the only way you could use it was with Sony software, which ran only on Windows, which I didn't use. Um, so then I I went online and I googled, you know, how how the hell do you use this thing, and you know what, are, you know, how do you get books on it, and so on. Uh, fortunately, at the time, there was a community of uh, enthusiastic uh, ebook reading people uh, called Mobile Read. I, I I found that community and I joined it. And with the help of uh, the community members, I ended up reverse engineering the proprietary USB protocol. And they also had their own uh, proprietary ebook format, which also I wrote tools to convert books to. Um, and I released this, this initial thing as an open source sort of library called libprs500 in the famous open source tradition of naming things badly. Um, then, uh, so uh, I, I, I just uploaded it, you know, just in the spirit of sharing. I was an academic at the time, and you know, it was natural to me. Um, and I was uh, surprised to see that a lot of people were interested in it, and other Linux users were really appreciative of it. Um, and so, the, and you know, because I had that community of mobile read, the, the, the enthusiasts that sort of gave me a lot of support and encouragement, and I went on to develop it further, add uh, support for more devices as they came along, and so on. So let me pause the story here to point out a couple of important points about uh, making open source projects. So the first is that uh, you can start small. So if you, if you look into the history of many famous open source uh, projects, you'll find that they all started as uh, the personal itch of their creator to solve some problem that he or she might have been having at the time. So for example, I think someone talked about uh, Linux being Minix. So that was Linus Torvalds' personal itch. Uh, similarly, if you're talking about Linus Torvalds, Git also started as a personal uh, project of his. 
So uh, the point is, don't be, don't be scared to start small. So like when I started uh, the PRS 500, I had no idea it would become my career one day. It was just something I did in my spare time for fun. Um, and that, you know, so the, the humble origins don't prevent something from becoming big later. The other important point is the importance of community. So uh, writing code is a fairly solitary activity. You spend all your time sitting in front of a computer, thinking, typing, running things, debugging things, cursing, throwing things at your monitor. Um, not a lot of human interaction. So uh, in the, to make this sustainable over the long term, you sort of, it's important that you, that you sort of find or build a community of like-minded enthusiasts, people who get what you're interested in, who you can talk with. Uh, you know, they'll provide you emotional support, eventually financial support. They'll form the nucleus of your user base. So it's really important as you start your project to work towards either finding or building a community around it. Um, that sort of helps a lot with a, the sort of long-term survival of your project. Uh, okay, so getting back to Calibre. Uh, so at the time I uploaded it as the PRS 500 and started gaining some traction, there was this website, single page, plain text, with download link. And so I decided, just for fun to add a donate button to it. Now, this is way back when uh, you know, there wasn't all the infrastructure that there is today, Patreon, GitHub, sponsors, whatever. Um, I had to figure out how to sort of get payments. I had no idea how to do that. I was on an F1 visa. I didn't know if it was legal for me to accept payments even. So anyway, it was a, it was a bit of an uh, uh, uphill climb. But I did that climb, and I ended up with a little donate button next to the download link. And I thought that, yeah, you know, this is nice, it'll get me a pizza a week, something like that. Um, but that donate button ended up becoming a career for me, and you know, here I am 20 years later, boring all of you. Um, so, uh, so the thing is that, so the point here I'm trying to make is that if you are interested in sustaining your open source project, you need to think about how to make it financially sustainable. So open source, as we all know, is free. You can't charge anybody for using it. Uh, so once you build the product, that's not enough. You also have to think about how to monetize it, at least to the extent that uh, it's sustainable. Uh, so you know, how you do it will depend on uh, your particular circumstances, what software you're using, what your user base is, et cetera. So Calibre is an end user uh, program. It's got millions of users. So donations is a viable path for funding it. Uh, but it, the, the important thing to note is that it, this does not happen automatically. You have to think about it, you have to work towards it, you have to experiment, you have to sort of make it happen. Just writing the code alone will not make it financially sustainable. Uh, so like, for example, in Calibre, the, the, there is still that donate button on the website, though it looks more fancy than it used to. Um, and it, within Calibre itself, there's a beating heart that encourages users to uh, donate. Uh, there are alternate uh, revenue channels. So Calibre has a large plugin ecosystem and plugin authors have uh, ways of asking users to support their plugins. Um, there's ad income from ads on the Calibre website and so on. So the point is that over time you have to work on finding ways and means to make your project sustainable because otherwise it'll just remain a sort of part-time hobby thing and it, it won't, you, won't, you won't have the time and resources to devote to it to really grow it. Um, and the other, I think the other major thing I want to emphasize is a sort of uh, focus on things apart from writing the code. So obviously to write open source software, you have to write a lot of code. I mean, Calibre has a million lines of code. But uh, there's a lot of other stuff that tends to get neglected by uh, uh, people who are new to the experience. And that's, so one of them I talked about already, community building. The other is, I think uh, Professor uh, Modgalia talked, spoke about documentation. So it's really, really important to write documentation. Um, so for example, Calibre has a thousand page plus user manual and of course, nobody reads it. But a documentation is still a force multiplier when you're doing support. So uh, for example, uh, you know, I, I deal with about 50 pieces of user communication every day. I've been doing this for 20 years, 365 days a year. So uh, to do this sustainably, you need to do a lot of automation. So uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of people ask questions that have already been answered or that are referenced in the documentation. So, you, so I, I have a system where just a few uh, keystrokes I can sort of auto-generate a reply for many of these questions. So these kind of things are really important to focus on apart from just you know, the code writing part because uh, the code writing part is obvious, but 
uh, to actually be successful and sustainable in the long term, you need to do a lot of other things apart from just writing the code. Uh, another, another important thing is uh, you need to focus on user feedback. So it, uh, so, so it often happens that you start writing an open source project because it's your own personal itch, your, your interests. And uh, there are things that you would like to do, things that you would like to focus on. But it sometimes happens that users have different ideas, different needs, they have different priorities, they ask for different features. And it's important that you spend at least some time uh, servicing the feature requests that you get from your users rather than just what you yourself would like to do. Um, so like, uh, so I, for instance, have a, a, a zero tolerance policy, policy for bugs. I tend to squash them almost as soon as they come in. And uh, feature requests either get implemented really quickly or denied as not suitable for the project. Um, so these, these, these sort of things will tend to grow and uh, build your community over time. And that community is what will allow you to keep working on open source sustainably. So for example, Caliber has been so successful that now I have had found the time to branch out and build Kitty, which is a terminal emulator, which I think was mentioned. Um, and yeah, it's much better than Alacrity. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, that's really what I wanted to say. Uh, I want to throw this open to questions. Uh, I'm here with 20 years of experience. So please, if you have any concerns, questions, ideas, bounce them off me. I'll be happy to uh, answer as best I can. If I have time, I don't know. Do I have time? <coughs> <laughs> it's better. Um, uh, the, long, the long answer is it has a lot more features. Uh, things, so as a terminal power user, you can uh, do things in Kitty that you really can't in Alacrity. Um, it's meant to facilitate a power user workflow with, uh, so there's a video on the Kitty website where I show you how I use it. You, you should watch that video, that'll answer your questions, I hope. Any others? What's your experience of you know, building an open source project out of India? Why did you do it out of India? Um, so I didn't actually do it out of India. I started it when I was in the US, but I came back soon afterwards. Um, so I, I was discussing with Venkatesh. Uh, so one of, one of my motivations for coming back to India uh, soon after uh, finishing my PhD was that India didn't have software patents. Um, it still doesn't, thankfully thanks to people like Venkatesh. Um, so, you know, one of the submarine dangers, things that people are not aware of uh, when building open source software is copyright, patents, things like that. A lot of projects can get derailed by these, so you have to be aware of them, you have to uh, think about them, think about how you mitigate that risk as part of building a long-term open source project. Okay, any more questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a question. Uh, recently, we've seen like a lot of projects, you know, do a kind of rug pull, uh, change the license, uh, mm -hmm. did this, uh, Terraform did this. Um, what's your take on that? Like, um, is it because they're not sustainable enough? And do you think like we're going to see more projects like this, uh, you know, do rug pulls in the future? Um, yeah, it would be because their maintainers felt that they weren't getting enough, probably financial support uh, for the amount of work that they put in. And it's a shame, I mean, it's, it's a real pity when it happens, um, which is why I said you have to focus on the financial aspect of your project. I mean, right from the beginning, you have to figure out how to make it financially sustainable, because otherwise you're gonna have, to, you know, you'll find yourself in a position where you have to do something like a rug pull. Um, I hope that we won't see a lot more projects doing this, but uh, sadly, you know, it's quite possible that we will. Since uh, looking interested in time, uh, Kovin G is here, so he, you can ask questions and figure out. Please give a big round of applause. <laughs>